Hey, okay, so guess what? <laughs> We're finally going to talk about Edith Hamilton. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, here's the reason why it took so long. Because for some reason, there's like glitches having to do with her education, at least when I was researching. The other reason is because I was hoping to find my copy of her book, Mythology. I I bought it when I was in high school, and I can't find it. I may have to buy it again. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Edith Hamilton. I mean... And, uh, I mean, when I was in high school, I took Myth and Legends. I've talked about that before. And there were books that the teacher suggested. There was also Bullfinch's Mythology, which I also can't find that book. So that might be another one that I'll have to. <laughs> and so, but. Edith Hamilton and Bullfinch's Mythology were two that the teacher suggested. And so I bought them and just figuring, you know, I'll kind of leaf through and, and use for the, the class and then maybe get rid of them, whatever. Well... <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> now, I am going to touch a little bit on Thomas Bullfinch. Okay, so Thomas Bullfinch, unlike Edith Hamilton, Thomas Bullfinch was a banker. And mainly his book has to do with the chivalry, you know, King Arthur and that sort of thing. There's a little bit of mythology and legend and that kind of thing. And so this was more like a hobby <laughs> or an interest, I should say, not so much a hobby, but an an interest. And but the interesting thing is that when he died it wasn't long before Edith Hamilton was born. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so he, it, it, he wasn't a classicist, not, I mean, I've looked him up and I have done some research. There's not a lot on him that I have been able to find, but no, he, he's not an educated classicist like Edith Hamilton is, but does that make his, uh, book completely a mess no I, look daniel p mannix wrote the book that gave us the movie gladiator what he did is he went to rome on holiday <laughs> vacation for us americans and he was blown away did a lot of research wrote the book there you go so it it, it really does not make it a terrible book. <laughs> so um, I will put information concerning Thomas Bullfinch. He's an interesting fellow. <laughs> and I highly recommend his book. I know that there are a lot of people who are strongly interested in mythology and legend and that sort of thing that will immediately say, well, this is completely outdated. Yeah, it was the 1860s. <laughs> We've learned a lot more since then. Just chill out, okay? <laughs> That's what archaeology does. We 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 learn more stuff, okay? Just <laughs> just chill. All right. So Edith Hamilton. <laughs> She was born in Dresden, Germany on August 12th, 1867. Okay, that doesn't make her German. As it turns out, her mother was visiting relatives. Her family is American, 
but yeah, um, her mother was in Germany and gave birth <laughs> to Edith. <laughs> However, there there were places that I found where they were saying that Edith uh, was very much. Uh, no, um, from what I was reading, his, her grandfather was Irish, so <laughs> so she's Irish German. <laughs> Uh, her mother then came back like a couple weeks later and, um, now her childhood was, <laughs> the, was a very interesting one. From what I was reading that her father had a business, like a grocery store business and it fell through um, so her her father was successful, but it turns out that after the business fell through, he withdrew from social life. However, her mother was a big social butterfly. <laughs> I can understand where the dad is coming from. I mean, like when something like that happens, you just, it, yeah, it. But when it comes to the children, now Edith was the oldest of five children, and they were encouraged to run and play. They had a big estate. They, um, so typical children, but the parents <laughs> did not like the public school system at all, did not think that they were teaching enough. And so at a young age, Edith and her siblings were learning languages such as French and Latin and German and, um, and Greek. And it seems like there was uh, one other one. What was it? Um, no, that was it. French, German, Latin, and Greek. And now... <laughs> Her, she and her siblings became very successful in what they did. Um, so Edith was an educator and author. Alice was the founder of industrial medication. Um, Margaret was an educator as well as a headmistress at the school that um, Edith went to uh, she was also because edith was also the headmistress and we'll talk about that nora was an artist now arthur was <laughs> he was the baby and um yeah he it said that he was like 19 years younger than edith so yeah he was he was a baby baby <laughs> and <laughs> Which was not uncommon. Um, in fact, in my family, uh, my grandmother has a sibling who is, um, yeah, she's about that young and compared to my uh, grandmother. And uh, so, but he was a writer and a professor of Spanish. He was also the assistant dean for foreign students at the University of Illinois, I think, let's see, if I want to say the full thing there, um, at Urbana-Champaign. So, but Arthur was the only one that married. They didn't have any children. So, now... <laughs> when it came to their further education, by the age of 16, Edith and her sisters went to uh, Miss Porter's school. Uh, it was uh, Miss Porter's finishing school. 
and uh, four young ladies, which is now known as Miss Porter School, so it's still there. It's in uh, Farmington, Connecticut. That was considered a family tradition with the Hamilton women. They were supposed to go to that school. And apparently three of Edith's aunts went there, three cousins, and of course then her sisters went there as well. Um, Edith didn't like it there. <laughs> Because when she was taught at home, she had, that was when her thirst for ancient, uh, ancient Greek and ancient Rome had really kickstarted. She thanked her dad actually for getting her started in loving uh, the ancient writings. Now, she also would write short stories. She was known as a wonderful storyteller, and she just, her imagination would go and everything. But when it came to the classics, um, such as, you know, the, the ancient uh, Greek and ancient Roman teachings, and you know, ancient writings, um, she she was hooked on it and she she wanted more and she had a real thirst for it she had a real passion that's the word i'm looking for she had a real passion for it but at miss porter's finishing school she's even quoted as saying we weren't taught anything <laughs> When I read that, it reminded me, there's a, a, a Calvin and Hobbes uh, comic where his dad is sitting and talking with him, and he's like, why are your grades so bad? Now, I know you like to learn because you have every, it seems like you have every dinosaur book there is and everything. Why, why are your grades so terrible? And he says, because we don't learn about dinosaurs. <laughs> It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, she left Miss Porter's school for uh, Bryn Mawr uh, College, which is in Philadelphia. And that is where she majored in the classics. She also majored in Greek and Latin, which I'm guessing that's the same thing. You can correct me, of course, uh, but it seems like that would be majored in languages and then majored in the classics. She finished two years with a master's in arts. Um, it, I'm also seeing that she received a bachelor's in arts. And that was in 1894. Now she uh, received what's called, she was awarded the Mary E. Garrett European Fellowship. This is a, that was considered the highest honor. And basically that says that she was given the chance to study for one year at any country. Um, so she was given a, like a cash award to go and, uh, <laughs> like a scholarship from what it sounds like. So she went with Alice because Alice had just graduated med school. So, <laughs> and this is where Edith became the first woman to enroll at the University of Munich over in Germany. Okay, well, but first, she had traveled with Alice, and they first went to the University of uh, Leipzig. I'm sorry if I say that incorrectly. <laughs> Leipzig or Leipzig. Again, German is rusty, so I'm I'm very sorry if I'm saying it incorrectly. Now... This is where you really see Edith Hamilton's 
passion for the classics. You know, her her classicist <laughs> is really showing right now. Um, because she was so disappointed in the courses. Now, the the professors were well educated in their language, you know, in the, in the languages such as Greek and and uh, Latin and and that. So it wasn't that. It was just their delivery on how the ancients uh their their delivery on what the ancients were trying to say through their writing. It just completely fell flat. And it was driving her nuts. <laughs> it was making her just, it's driving her bananas. <laughs> and uh, so she, she was, but she, she tried to make the classes work. So she, she was originally enrolled in the University of Leipzig. And she just, she couldn't take it anymore. She, she just could not take it anymore. Now, her sister Alice stayed there, but, um, <laughs> but Edith left and went to to uh, Munich and Alice talks about just the the stir that Edith caused because of the fact that this is the first woman to enroll in this college so um they had to set up conditions I mean, they, they, they were treating her like she had some sort of disease or something, <laughs> because according to Alice, when Edith arrived at her first class, she was escorted to the lecture platform and seated in a chair beside the lecturer facing the audience so that nobody would be contaminated by contact with her. Edith is quoted as saying, the head of the university used to stare at me, then shake his head and say sadly to a colleague, there now, you see what's happened? We're right in the midst of the woman question. <laughs> she wasn't trying to stir trouble, but she sure did. <laughs> I wonder if they knew that she could speak German. <laughs> but once she settled in, I mean, she loved it there. And it sounds like her professors in enjoyed having her in class. Um, she, uh, she got, now, now this is where it, it, it got a little, because she did yeah it says she might have stayed at Munich and earned her PhD if two events had not happened okay and one is that her father lost his money and, and that's where he went into seclusion um, then she also received a call from the Dean of Bryn Mawr College, a Miss M. Carey Thomas, who offered her a position as headmistress of Bryn Mawr Preparatory School in Baltimore, Maryland. So, um, yeah, she it it says PhD. Another place said a a, a doctoral degree. I'm not familiar with. Uh, what the degrees were. I had it written down that she did get her degree. So apparently I read that wrong. My dyslexia being what it is. So she was offered this position and it, it, it really were, in fact, 
I believe it's Bryn Mawr where, yeah, it has to be Bryn Mawr because I don't think she worked anywhere. I don't think she worked in any other college. But, um, and again, her sister worked here as well. They actually still have her portrait up. And um, in fact, I saw a couple of years ago where they had taken down the portrait and I guess people were asking, where's Edith Hamilton? <laughs> They just taken it down to clean and <laughs> so <laughs> but um so I found that interesting that they I mean I d I don't know why. I don't know why I found stuff like that interesting. I mean here at our library we still have uh paintings of our founder and his wife. Yeah, in the library we still have those paintings. And uh, on one side, because there's two sides, and on the one side is his painting, and the other side is his wife's painting. So, but um, <laughs> <laughs> now she was at this point when she's working. She is 29 years old. She started working there in 1896. Okay. And she continued working there until 1922, I believe, is when she... And... Um, <laughs> in fact... Um, I think it was that they actually had to tell her, please leave. <laughs> You, 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 we love you, but we need to, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Well, um, the students loved her. They absolutely loved her personality, and she was, <laughs> so, um, and she enjoyed working there. Just, she was a perfect fit for the school. And um, in fact, one of the, uh, let's see, one of the stories here is, yeah, Hamilton was unafraid to suggest new initiatives such as having her school's basketball team compete against another girl's team from a nearby boarding school. The proposed athletic competition was considered a scandalous suggestion for the time because news coverage would include the names of the participants. After Hamilton convinced the local press not to cover the event, the game, the games proceeded and it became an annual tradition. So, <laughs> so this is why I love her. This is, I mean, not only is she, you know, with the, uh, a successful writer and, and, you know, big in with the, the, as a classicist and passionate about what she does, but in other ways, she's successful. I mean, just the fact that this would have been a, a huge scandal for the school, but she stepped in and was like, no. <laughs> All you have to do is not print that. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> oh, goodness. There are other stories as well. Um, another one. Oh, where was it? I Yeah, it says the fondest memories of her students revolved around her courses. Uh Oh, maybe it's not here. Um but there was a story where I guess I don't have it pulled up where there was a student who really didn't understand the classics and you know they they wouldn't know uh Euripides from Plato 
And so they, they were having a hard time with that. And uh, Edith Hamilton happened to overhear that conversation. And she, she says, oh, oh, let me help you with that. And I mean, she's she's so excited about helping this uh, student takes her into the library and starts pulling books off the shelf that would help her with her education and starts talking to her about uh, these uh, ancient writers such as uh, Euripides and Plato and Socrates and, and everything and just completely excited. This student in her account said that it was like having afternoon tea with <laughs> these ancients. She said it was easy to understand. For some reason, it was all garbled in my mind when I was listening to my professor. But after talking to her, I completely understood everything. I, I understood the difference between Socrates and Plato and what each one was. And so... Um, and I wish I could, I'll, I'll try and find it and, and put it in the description box. It, it could be further down in one of these, but, um, so that shows her dedication to her passion and at the same time wanting to pass it on to other people and, and help them to understand it and, and enjoy it as much as she does. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that, that's another reason I, I love her. And um, when I read that, I was like, that, <laughs> I mean, I loved her before, but to, to hear how passionate, you know, just, just the pure passion that she had to, to help other students like that. And, and the way that she did it is, is just um, fantastic. And now she um, she did after finally after twenty six years she was tired of her work and decided it was time to retire. Okay, so she was the one that decided it was time to leave as headmistress and to leave the school. And I thought they were saying that it was time for her to go. <laughs> Um, on March 22nd, 1922, um, the Bryn Mawr College denied reports that they forced her to retire. So that's where it got screwed up in my brain. <laughs> they did not force her. She needed to go. She was aging and she wanted to enjoy her later years. That's what it was. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, in her later years, that's when she started her writing career. However, <laughs> it's interesting how this came about. So when she started writing, you know, like uh, when it came about that she um wrote down her fir first book now you have to understand that by this time uh there were a lot of like uh pamphlets and magazines that would talk about certain things like plays and 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 that's there were a lot of stuff like that well she went to a party with a friend and it turned out that the editor either the editor or the writer of one of these magazines got to talking with Edith Hamilton and was blown away by her, um, by Edith's knowledge of ancient Greek plays. <laughs> she, she was just, I mean, the fact that here's Edith just talking about these ancient plays and everything and it... <laughs> can you imagine standing in a party 
And in the 1960s, I believe this was in the 60s at this point. It could be the 20s because um, I didn't write it down here what year it was. Let's see. Does it say here? Uh, in the autumn of 1924. Okay, so it was the 20s. But even at that, by this point, you know, you had like the film photo play magazines. They were doing the silent film magazines and they had other stuff like that. And and they did have magazines having to do with, and, and they did have pamphlets and stuff like that having to do with the arts and that sort of thing. So, um, and it did go into the 60s. But, <laughs> and so I wasn't too far off. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of those photo play uh, magazines. I believe some of the makeup artists are using them now to do like the uh, history those are a lot of fun to watch, actually. <laughs> the historical makeup. and uh, But that's off track. Anyway, so in 1990, 1924, she's in New York at this point, and she went to this party, and she's talking about <laughs> Sophocles and Euripides, and this uh rosamund gilder that was the editor of the theater arts of this theater arts magazine is just blown away and even asked her she's like well do you think that you could do like this do you think you could write out something for my uh for for theater arts and edith is like i don't think so no i mean i enjoy talking about it and everything but as for actually releasing something like that i don't think so and <laughs> well rosamond didn't let up no she she didn't i mean this was intrigued look i gotta be honest i would be intrigued too i mean <laughs> because again this is during the time when silent film was big uh, and everything i mean you're seeing big stars like buster keaton and and harold lloyd mary pickford rudolph valentino and and uh clara bow and all that and this person is talking about sophocles <laughs> come on <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you you would uh, you would definitely want that to be a part of your. That would be such a unique article, such a unique article, and well, Edith Hamilton finally caved. She's like, all right, I'll go ahead and I'll write this. So she wrote a, an article and she she sent it to uh, Rosamund Gilder. And the article received extremely high praise. So she wrote more. <laughs> she was told, Hamilton was told, you are that unusual combination, a gifted talker and a gifted writer. To be a gifted talker can be fatal to a writer. Which is true. It, it, very, very true. Um, <laughs> I, I have it written here that talking can sometimes destroy what you later write because people remember everything. <laughs> It's like you go back to write down and it's like, well, that that's not what, because if you're a, a storyteller like she was and, and people love your storytelling and then you go to write something down and it does not match what was coming out of your mouth, <laughs> your writing is not the gift. That's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so, mm -hmm. so, so she was 
extremely gifted with her writing and and her storytelling. I I wish I looked for um, any kind of recording of Edith Hamilton. I couldn't find any, but I will still look and I'll put it in the description box, of course. But because um, even just to hear her speak would be amazing uh, for, for a fan like me. And um, so these articles were then put together in a book called The Greek Way, which was published in 1930. That was her first book. She was 63 years old. This is why age does not matter. These people that keep saying, oh, you know, you're too old to be doing this. You're too old to be doing that. <laughs> no. <laughs> she was 63 and she put out her first book. <laughs> and then two years later, she put out another one called The Roman Way. Now, um, I'm not sure if that one was articles for uh, for uh, the Theater Arts Monthly, or if it was just because she caught the writing bug, if, if Edith had just caught the writing bug. Um, we'll just say 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> and... Of course, uh, these books were showing the relationship of agent life to the present and are considered classics in their own right. And uh, I have no, I have not read them, <laughs> surprisingly. You know, I, I said, I, what one was that? Uh, I believe it was the uh, the Odyssey you know, modernizing the Odyssey. And I spoke about uh, Edith Hamilton and um, how she compared uh, the ancient writings to today. I, I think I touched on that. And um, well, here's here's the books that <laughs> <I> did that. <laughs> but the only book that, oh, and, and I also mentioned that the... Um, the the Plato's dialogue that I have is not translated by her, and I really hoped it was. <laughs> so here we get into her translations and everything. Um, <laughs> and she's quoted as saying, when she was asked why she started writing books, she said that she was bullied into it. And I I have to agree with her on that one. I think if uh, Rosalind hadn't uh, kept asking, she wouldn't have done it. You know, she was just enjoying her retirement. You know, she enjoyed talking about these, you know, this is something that she enjoyed talking about. Rosalind kept asking her, oh, come on, just give me an article. Give me an article. She was being pushy. So uh, I agree with her that she was bullied to uh, write these two books. And uh, so <laughs> you're bullying an old lady. <laughs> She now to continue the list of books that she wrote. Um, she did the Prophets of Israel that was in 1936, the three Greek plays that was in 1937, the Great Age of Greek Literature that was in 1942, Mythology, which is the one I have, <laughs> couldn't find. It's here somewhere. I would like to think I may have to buy it again. And um, and that was in 1943, Witness to the Truth, Christ and His Interpreters. That's the whole title. Uh, that's in 1948, Spokesman of God, The Great Teachers of the Old Testament. That's in 1949, 
The Echo of Greece, that's in 1957. The Age of Heroes, an introduction to Greek mythology, 1957. The Collected Dialogues of Plato in 1961. Again, let me see something here. Be very careful so things don't fall down. Is this the Collected? No, it just says Great Dialogues of Plato. Okay, so it's a different one. I think we looked at that before. Um, and then the ever present past in 1964. So those are a collection of her translations and books. Um, <laughs> this is something I, I made a note here about mythology because I was seeing it a lot, uh, <laughs> reviews on her book i was seeing it on bullfinch's mythology too and I, and I mentioned it a little bit at the beginning that people are like well this is painfully outdated duh <laughs> we have learned so much more about do, do people not read what year it was released <laughs> Starting to get ahead of myself. <laughs> like, even though it was written back, and even Bullfinch's when it was written in the 1860s, this is information that is still important. You can say, well, it's completely outdated and it's no good now. Yeah, it is. Because actually this information helped to get to where we're at now in learning this topic. <laughs> what? <laughs> Weird people. I just find it funny that you buy a book and then you're mad because it's completely outdated. It's like, look at the copyright. Look at what year it's... Research the thing before you... <laughs> Crack me up. <laughs> oh, good heavens. Oh, good heavens. Me. Oh. Oh. <sighs> I'm sorry, but yeah, the book is out. Like, Bullfinch's mythology and, and her mythology book, yeah, they were written in like the 50s and, and, and the 1860s and everything, but reading those books helped to further, if, if we didn't have any information concerning any of that stuff, if nobody bothered to translate the ancient writings or bothered to be a classicist in general where would we be <laughs> think about that for five minutes <laughs> oh my gosh Ugh. seriously oh <laughs> man okay so, yeah, she, <laughs> so now that she's a writer and, and translating and everything, I'm kind of surprised that she waited till her, because I couldn't find anything where during her time when she was working at the college that she was translating um, ancient works. That doesn't mean that she didn't. I just didn't see anywhere that... So, uh, maybe she was. <laughs> Especially when it came to the... Um, 
the student that that talked about how she was having a rough time understanding and then she had that moment with yeah so it's possible that she was but now that she has some uh books out such as the greek way and the roman way mythology and and that sort of thing she's starting to rub shoulders with some famous people such as robert frost and a novelist isaac uh uh denison <laughs> i i'm sorry if i'm saying his name incorrectly uh and also a, a historian named arnold uh toenby <laughs> I swear I get tongue-tied saying these names. And I feel bad. So this is what she was doing in the 50s. Is She was meeting these people, these poets and historians and, and novelists. And, and then it turns out that at the age of 90, this... <laughs> Uh, she was invited to go to Athens, okay, and she was given the gold cross of the Legion of the Benefaction by King Paul of Greece and made an honorary citizen of Athens. And, I mean, that's that's a big deal right there. The next year, in 1958, uh, she was awarded the Constance Lindsay Skinner Award for Literature. Now, while she was in Athens, she was, oh, what was it? Oh. <laughs> yeah, she saw her translation of Prometheus Bound performed at the ancient Odeon Theater of Herodotus Atticus. Um... So, I mean, she claimed, she stated that that the the ceremony that happened and everything that was the proudest moment of her life. Yeah. But um As for Edith Hamilton, after her uh, after her time at uh, Athens, she suffered a stroke, and the doctor said she would never recover. Yeah, strokes are awful like that. The doctor told Reed, you basically need to face the fact that she will never walk again or never talk again. <laughs> and Hamilton opened up her eyes and said, who? <laughs> She's a feisty lady. She sure is. And she recovered. You know, <laughs> I love these stories. because Here she is. She's in her 90s. And she has a stroke. The doctor says, "You're, you know, this is the way it is," and she proves him wrong. If you remember, I did the video on Marie and Grace Eline, and Grace was in a horrible, horrible car accident that shattered her legs and arms. And the doctor said that she's basically bedridden. She's never going to walk again. She's never going to. Grace proved her wrong. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, now a week before she died, she uh, Hamilton was trying to finish a book about Plato, but she passed away on May 31st, 1963 in Washington, D.C. So even... <laughs> So, um, I mean, <laughs> that's still, still working up until the day she died. But, um, this is Edith Hamilton. And <laughs> the, the classicist, I was introduced to her through my high school myth and legends teacher. I don't know where that book is. I had hoped to have it for this thing, but um, I mean, not only was she a classicist, but to be the first woman to attend the University of Munich and to basically say, oh no, th this basketball team, we're gonna do that. We're gonna play the best. <laughs> <laughs> do all that to step in and let that happen and you know she I have a feeling she was one of those ladies that had no problem saying it like it was I mean to basically say yeah I was bullied into writing in my older age I mean she was in her 60s when she started writing and she was I do agree with that you know but she seemed to enjoy it because she kept doing it it wasn't just the Greek way and the Roman way. She could have stopped there, but she kept going. <laughs> so, but I'm a big fan of Edith Hamilton, and um, I highly recommend her book. I'll put all the information in the description box. That is Edith Hamilton.